from my role as a uh, faculty member at the seminary here in town. I have the regular privilege of speaking in churches, so uh, this is actually my fourth of six straight weeks speaking somewhere. Now often, uh, when, when I'm finished, my, my family never joins me, and uh, my friends are not normally there, and sometimes they'll say, how'd it go? And my standard response was, I loved everything that I said. <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone else did. Uh, you, you would have to ask them. Today, I know many of you will probably not like what I have to say. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Now, Pastor Ryan is not here this morning, and he made the mistake of saying I could speak on whatever I wanted. <laughs> So um, I'm sharing something that I, I genuinely think is very positive. Uh, it's, it's changed my life in a lot of ways. It's kind of the historic Christian perspective of how one would find inner peace and also be helpful for other people. Doesn't that sound positive? Very positive. The problem is um, kind of how historic Christianity says that we get there or how that you appropriate it, I'm not sure that you're going to like it. So there's a couple of things I want to say on the front end. One, I didn't make this stuff up, okay? It's, it's not Brian, uh, Brian's ideas or Brian's musings. These are ideas or views of life that have been around since the beginning of Christianity are not quite as much in favor today, but are true to the whole history. And secondly, as I often do when I teach, we will have time to interact together. So if there's something I said that you didn't like, or you find offensive, or you want to make a comment, when I'm done, someone will come around with a microphone, and we can interact together. And as a good faculty member, I also have a little hand up that, that we will pass out. Um, probably the, the, um, the easiest way to get at this today will be to talk about different, maybe four different uh, views of the good life or the purpose of life. And my guess is you will see aspects of yourself in all four of them, but I think it's probably the easiest way to, to kind of explain this historic Christian view of how we find inner peace and become helpful to others. Okay, so this first perspective on the good life or the purpose of life. Number one, this life is all that there is. You'd better get yours. Now, I, I think this is probably pretty self-explanatory. It's the view that you only go around once. There's nothing after this. This is it. Life is difficult, competitive, and it's brief. So you got to do whatever you got to do to find happiness now, because this is all that you have. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, kind of referring back to the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, mentions this way of life, where he says, if the dead are not raised, or this life is really all that there is and there isn't something else, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. If this is all we got, you might as well enjoy life the most that you can because it's over pretty briefly. Now, there is an advantage to this way of life. There's an advantage to all the ones I will mention because if there wasn't, no one would follow them, right? Part of the advantage is it makes it easier to be successful professionally or just kind of go for whatever you want in life, at least in the short run. There's nothing holding you back. This is it. Just do it. Maybe we would illustrate this way of life with uh, maybe the stereotypical image of frat boys. Just kind of living for themselves, living for the moment. Or maybe if you think back, maybe not all of you, you're good people, but for some of us, when we think back to what we were like as teenagers. What do I want to do? What seems like it will make me happy? Let's do this. The problem is, where this gets complicated, is if life is not going well for you, then what do you do? 
And here we end up with the uh, slimy corporate executive, or maybe the politician, that whatever uh, increases shareholder value or gets votes, you will do, even if it's not good for society. Because you got to do what you got to do. In the most extreme form, obviously, this would be a hardened criminal who simply lives for what feels good to them. Or a war criminal, maybe someone like Vladimir Putin. Uh, scholars who study Putin would say this is genuinely what he believes. Life is brief, this is all that's here. It's hard, it's competitive. I got to do what I got to do to help Russia, because this is what we are all doing. Long, long time ago, I think before I even had kids, when I was a very young minister, a middle-aged man came to talk to me, and he's like, hey, uh, you got this pastor thing going, you can't tell people what I tell you, right? I'm like, no, that's true. It's kind of, it's kind of like attorney client privilege. I can't, I can't tell anyone. And he's like, well, I just, you know, I think I knew what I want to do. I just wanted to run something by you. He's like, so um, there's this gal at work, and she is smoking hot. I mean, smoking hot. And she's kind of let me know that if we want to kind of be together, I could be with her. He's like, hey, I know what you're going to say. I know I got a couple of kids, I got a wife, my wife's a sweetheart, I'm not going to leave her or anything like this, I'm just, I'm just going to do this. Um, and I was like, <sighs> you can imagine some of my response. And he's like, well, one of my buddies at work says, one day, if you don't take this opportunity, one day when you're old and gray, you will have wished you had. That would be an illustration. This life is all that, you're, that there is. You'd better get yours. All right, number two. Second view of the good life or the purpose of life. Eternity with an all-powerful God is everything. Don't waste your time pleasing people. Trust in God. Believe in a holy creator. This is all that matters. Um, Finding a way to be with God in eternity Everything else pales in comparison. Don't worry about what others think. These people probably don't know God anyways. Just trust who God is. I think we see this illustrated a little bit in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. It says, Jesus sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village. But the people there did not welcome him. When James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? They left everything to follow Jesus. They were convinced that giving your life fully, 100% to who God is, regardless of what the world thinks, is everything. And so when they encountered some other people who didn't believe, and even more were pretty rough with them, their first thought was, Maybe we should take them out. Maybe that's what God would have us to do. Now, again, there's an advantage to this way of life. It's, it helps you to have courage, to be bold. People who genuinely believe this way, they don't deal with a lot of anxiety. They feel pretty solid about who they are and how they are living. They don't worry what people think of them. If people put you on blast online, oh, well... God knows what you're saying is the truth, and you will ultimately be vindicated. If you get sick and die, oh well, you go to heaven. There's nothing to fear. The problem is how sometimes people who believe and live this way treat other people. So obviously in a very extreme form, this is where you would have religious terrorism, religious violence. God's holy, everyone should follow God. If people aren't following God or worse, if they are leading others to not follow God, we should do something about them for God. And hey, yeah, it's bloody and it's messy, but maybe some people will find the truth. Is it, does it matter if they lose their life, if they find forgiveness and find God in the afterlife? 
in a much less extreme form, I certainly don't want to equate them, but a form of this that is still problematic, in my opinion, I think we can find in a lot of contemporary American churches. I've heard it in churches in this town. Someone like me stands up front and says something like, look, everyone's talking about race relations or racial justice or environmental causes or how do we improve education for the young or how do we prolong life. But does any of this stuff really matter? What really matters is that you're forgiven, not all of these other things. And frankly, people don't say this on CNN, but frankly, all of this is going to burn one day anyway. So those causes or concerns don't matter. Now, my guess is being at a church on Sunday morning, there's probably at least a couple of you that hold to this view, and if you hold to it, I understand. I do in some ways. I certainly have in the past. I understand, particularly if you lived a kind of life that was messy and complex, and you have found God in the Bible and faith, and it's changed everything. Sign me up for that. It can be very easy to say that's all that matters. And in some ways, that's right. But I want to encourage you If your faith is helping you to feel confident and secure and at peace, but yet others in your life feel like it is leading you to be less than kind to them, you might want to evaluate some aspects of your faith, at least. Okay, number three. There's only four. Number three, view of the good life or purpose of life. I believe in a higher power, but who really knows a whole bunch of the details? Be a good person and help change the world. Now, my guess is this describes probably a few more of us in this room. Sure, there's, I believe in a God, I believe someone's out there. And if spirituality can help make a practical difference to make the world better, I'm all for it. But I want to be a part of the solution, not the problem. And sometimes religion just feels really narrow. And at the end of the day, all that really matters is if I am part of a movement that is changing the world for the better. Again, probably a number of us here. Acts chapter 1. It says, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to his disciples and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? You see what's happening. People were drawn to him. They followed him for three and a half years. They were his students. They saw him be crucified, he's resurrected from the dead, and their first question is, are you now finally going to fix the broken world? Are you now finally going to make our culture the way it should be? And again, I assume there are a number of you here that kind of resonate pretty deeply with number three. Many of you that I love and respect. If there are good things happening in the world, it's probably because of you. If the hungry are being fed, you are doing it. If we live in a neighborhood the way most of us do, where you can be white or black or brown or Christian or Muslim or Sikh or a traditional family or queer, and we all reasonably get along, that's thanks to people like you. People who for a long time have been working to make our world, our culture, our neighborhoods a better place. So what's the problem with this view? What if, what if everything you're working for never comes to fruition? Even worse, what if everything in our world, in your family, in your relationships, in our society, gets way worse than it is now? Where will you be? 
If your self-identity is, I'm the one who, who brings health to my family. My parents were a certain way, and I guess they meant well, but they didn't really get it. But me and my partner, we are going to do things better in our family. What do you do if that guy leaves you? What do you do if the doctor says, I'm sorry, your daughter will always be dependent on you. There's nothing we can do about this. What if your whole identity is, I am making a better family, and yet your family will actually be more complicated than the one you came from? Let's go a little further. What if Russia and Ukraine and Hamas and Israel are only the beginning? What if the political divisions and nastiness we've experienced the last several years is only the beginning? What if people are going to be killing each other in the streets politically here? And you can't bring peace. And you can't make the world better. What if the worst of scientists' fears come to fruition? And our climate doesn't just change but we all exist in a different biological context that makes a whole bunch of us sick, and some people die, and we can't do anything about it. Then what do you have? Now, I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a, a doomer. I'm not making predictions. I don't feel like it's the end of the world. I don't think that. But it's not impossible that you and I are living in a time historically where for a while it's going to feel like the end of the world. It's happened before. It's possible, I'm not saying it is, I don't know, any more than you do, but it's possible we live in a time where 500 years from now historians will talk about all the craziness that happened in the 21st century. What do you do if your identity is, I am part of the solution that's making the world better, if you can't make it better and it gets worse. Number four, the fourth one, I would describe this as kind of the historic Christian view. Eternity with the God of love and goodness is everything, therefore become a beautiful soul. I think this view kind of brings together, if you will, the best of two and three. It does claim, and this is what's hard for a lot of us today, it does claim that this world is the shadow. It's not the most real. It's temporary. It's brief. That real reality is found in the next life. And that if you're trying to build your identity or your life on things lasting in this world, you will always be frustrated and angry and despondent. But it also says the reason that we are here is to become a beautiful person on the inside. It does matter how we treat the poor. It does matter how we get along with our enemies. It does matter if we kind of foment divisions or peace because that's all shaping the kind of being that we will be in the next life. Matthew 16 says, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and that he must be killed on the third and on the third day be raised to life. So it's all kind of here. Jesus of Nazareth, the greatest human being ever, <laughs> who is about the most good, is cru crucified and executed by society, but he will be exalted in the spiritual realm, if you will. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. His primary disciples saying, no, 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 we're changing the world. You're not going to get crucified. We're going to win. We're going to be the difference. We're going to make everything the way it should be. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, 
but merely human concerns. So his main disciple, he's calling the embodiment of evil. And he's saying, if you think that at the end of the day, my own my only identity is I'm one who's going to change everything in this world right now. You're opposed to what God is doing. Verse 24. Then Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Saying, let go of earthly desires even some of your goals to change everything for the better, engage me, find what ultimately matters, you will be transformed, and you will find the whole point. Verse 26, where he culminates by saying, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Very different view than many of us have right now. This is the shadow. It's temporary. It's not the most real. Don't trust it. Don't plan on it. Don't count on it. But it matters what you do here because this echoes into the ultimate reality. Way back when I was 17, I worked as a server at a, re- at a restaurant. At the time, that was a lot of money to me at 17. But for a woman named Pam that I worked with, it would have been kind of a crummy job. Uh, Pam was kind of a frumpy, middle-aged, very plain woman. And I could tell by all the hours she had to work and the look of her car in the driveway, and a little bit she mentioned about her family, that she did not have an easy life. And she, yet, she might have been one of the most amazing people I've ever met. 30 years later, I still remember her. Pam cared about all of us. She acted, at least, thrilled to see me. And every time I had to talk about all my petty little teenage problems, she would listen patiently and encourage me. When there was conflict in the back of the house, that's the kitchen in the restaurant, she was the one who would bring calm. She had a way of making everything better. But there were two things about Pam that were kind of unusual, at at least to me. One is why at the time I didn't have words, why I was so drawn to her. She was at least my mom's age, not really an attractive person, not super charismatic, definitely not cool, and yet she radiated out this sense of life that was compelling that just drew all of us to her. And number two, She made it clear to those of us who got to know her that Jesus was everything to her, and she tried to live her life according to his vision, but I never heard her talk about politics or controversial social issues. I don't even remember her telling me what was right and wrong and what I should do. There was a lightness to her being that helped her face challenges. It was like she was plugged in to everything that was good, and she kind of channeled hope to the rest of us. Thirty years later, I still remember Pam. I think she embodied this view that eternity with the God of love and goodness is everything. And this is how, because she held it lightly, this is how she didn't have a lot of money, She wasn't super healthy. She had complicated relationships. And yet, not only was she able to keep going, she had something to offer the rest of us because she wasn't wasn't trusting here. And yet, she was becoming a beautiful soul. She lived into this purpose. She wasn't trying to get hers. She wasn't trying to change other people but she was a different kind of person 
that drew us to her. Historically, in my opinion, Christian faith would say this is the way. And that's what Pam was living. Okay, that's, that's all I have. Can I get you to pass a couple of these out? Um, we'll have some time to interact together. I think somebody has a microphone. If you have a question, comment, disagreement, put up your hand. Here's a handout coming around. I'm sorry, I just felt like I had to do that. Um, about a page and a half is just quotations from different people. And then there's about a half page if you're like, this is really abstract. If I in any way buy in, what would I do? What, what, what could I do to help me live into that? So I just put a couple of things on there as well. So, uh, again, if you have a question, comment, disagreement, I don't know that I have any answers, but I'd be happy to interact with you a little All bit. All right, so I got a mic here, and then you can also, I can, you can raise your hand, I'll come around. If you want to text 94000, if you text that, put in your question, I'll get it here on my phone too, so if you want to remain anonymous uh, or want to push back. Do it in person or over text. Uh, so nine or zero zero zero. Uh, anyone? Anyone got something right away? All right, Brad. I'm gonna hold the mic because <laughs> you know. All right. So um. So for those of us that are that are looking to to follow Jesus and and to pursue God in 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 our world here, I presume that one of the four choices that we make here, hopefully, you know, probably number four sort of flows out of that. So my question for you is, what is your understanding of what God is doing in the world, and how does that inform the way that you think about sort of how we should be living? Great, great. Um, so again, Brian's opinion, but I think this is what historically Christian Bright Lights would say. What God is doing in the world is looking for people who are open to take on God's character. That's what God's doing. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to sound negative. <laughs> you can let me know if this sounds too cynical. I don't know that history has like a plan necessarily. I think it is kind of a grand drama of different times, different peoples, different places, different cultures some people open themselves to everything that is good and beautiful and loving and experience God flowing through them, channeling through them to others, and a bunch of people don't. And that's what God is doing. Where I think as contemporary people, we tend to think, we tend to spend more time on what's God want me to do for a job or what, you know, should I marry this person or not? Or, and I don't want to say those are small matters. They're huge matters of our life. I'm not sure that's the main thing God is doing. I think the main thing God is doing is helping those of us who are open to become more like God. A uh, question that came in is, uh, how do we keep questions like this before us and continue to live and examine the life? Um, I wish I could ask a follow-up, but I, I, I guess it's, it's hard to do that. Um, one of the things I will say, this path that I, that I think Jesus calls us to, it is really difficult in our day and age and culture because most of us are, pers most of us are assuming, part of what it means to be a modern American is to assume if you work hard and you're a decent person and you're smart, you can make all your dreams come true in this life. And almost all of us are living that way. Uh, even in churches, we tend to think Jesus is a different way to that. If I really get into Jesus, then everything will flat. My relationships will get better, work will go better, I'll make more money, I'll be healthier. Um, and so... I think we have to choose some patterns of life to intentionally be different than the direction of our culture. A couple of those I try to mention there on the, on the one half page of some things we could maybe do. Anybody here? Come on, you're thinking it. I got an online question then, a text question. 
Uh, do many non-Christian religious practitioners abide by a similar martyr mentality that gives them purpose for their own lives? For example, do many Jewish people live by philosophy number four? That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. My experience would be, okay, there's only one God, according to Christian orthodoxy. There's only one God who made all peoples everywhere. So if anyone is open to what's true or what's good or what's lovely, no matter who they are or where they are, they're going to move closer to that God. And so I think in other religious traditions, there are people that are moving in this direction towards number four, the best that they know how. I would say they're moving towards Jesus. They just don't know that would be my view of this. Um, but in any religious tradition, there's a lot of people that are kind of mixing worldly desire with some sense of God and some people that are terrible, just as we have in Christianity. It's, it's the same. Same that way as some people genuinely seeking and some people doing things that are not helpful. Um, I have a question about the uh, idea of becoming a beautiful soul. In what way is like Jesus different than, say, Plato? The idea of being, you know, in our modern idea, the word soul often thinks of like a non-physical spiritual reality. Mm -hmm. In which ways is like Jesus and like Jewish and Christian thinking of like the resurrection of the body mm -hmm. affirm creation in a different way? Uh, you said a lot there, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best, and you can let me know if I'm not being helpful. One... Um, I think Plato, in an earlier time, a few centuries pre-Jesus, was trying to do something similar, but obviously had less revelation. If you read early church writers, they view Plato and Aristotle almost like how we view Moses. Uh, some even use the term uh, Christian before Christ. They see similarities there. And as someone who's read a lot of Plato, um, I don't think you can go two pages of reading Plato without being like, oh, that's where Paul gets that, that's where James gets that. There's parables of Jesus that are straight Plato. Um, so there is some connection. But Jesus is the pinnacle. Jesus is the source. Jesus is Lord, as a committed Christian, to me at least. Um, and I think some of the other leaders are open and are having some kind of connection, but, but Jesus is the one. Jesus is the Son of God. So I don't know if I fully answered where you were going there. Um, but yes, I don't, I don't personally agree. I, I actually think the early and medieval church would disagree with the contemporary Christian notion that uh, it's not really about the state of our soul. It's more about what happens in this world, and therefore we look to resurrection. Of course there's resurrection, and of course it matters what we do in this world. Um, but earlier Christian writers would say, like, the, the whole reason we are here is to take on God's character, to become like Jesus in our, in our being, in our essence. Because everything in this world is transitory. Y'all didn't think you're going to get Platonic thought and existentialism Sorry. on Sunday, Sorry. did you? Sorry. Uh, we're going to the deep waters. Um, this kind of goes on that question uh, a little bit too, though, is how can modern Christianity learn from other religions and yet not lose our faith in Christ? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, Jesus is for anything that is good and beautiful. So in any source... Uh, if we find things that are good and beautiful and it brings out the best of you and helps you to be other-centered and thankful and grateful, Jesus is for that. And again, if you believe there's one God who created all people, we should expect everyone to a certain degree has some connection with this, with this God. Um, I, don't, I don't worry too much about committed Christians being swayed by other religions because I think it's pretty hard to beat Jesus. I think it's, I think it's very hard to beat Jesus. This is just a quick thing. Maybe I missed it, but the four philosophies, are you saying they all have something wrong with them? Or like the mm. last one was kind of like 
great. the less problematic one. Great, great. Um, so this is Brian's attempt to put in words what's hard to put in words, okay? I think the fourth one is the Christian view. I think the other three have advantages and disadvantages and are quite common for most of us. But the fourth one would be historically the Christian view. Okay, we'll do a couple more here. Brian, I totally realize that I've been staunchly in three and that I've been like on a journey to start turning my wheel toward four. And I, my question for you is, will I ever have a moment where I don't want to try to help if I see something that's ugly and broken and bad? And is it okay that I still want to help, but will I just learn, you know, to kind of leave it in God's hands? Or like how, what should I be looking for in terms of that mm. shift to not automatically oh. try to be a helper? If, if we do not want to help people, we have, uh, we have veered off from the path of Jesus. So I want to be very clear. Part of the sign of Jesus in my life is I care about people I normally wouldn't care about. So I think the ultimate sign of Jesus in our life isn't simply I have more compassion. It's actually I have more compassion for people that I think are wrong. That's probably the ultimate sign of Jesus growing in my life. So I want to be clear. It's not the way of Jesus is you don't help, you don't care. It's you don't expect that if we just figure out and work hard enough and, and get our stupid parents to get with the right views, that like finally we'll be able to. That's just not human history. What human history is, is there's pockets of beautiful life and things are better, and then a new issue emerges that no one expected that has lots of problems, or there are pockets of beauty and a better form of life, and then powers come in and just destroy it all. I mean, I don't, it's just, it's history, read it. Um, so it, it's not that we're not called to not help, we are called to be the helpers. We just don't expect that we're gonna find what we are looking for in that process, if that makes sense. Great question. I'm sorry if I'm not being clear today. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's give Brian a big round of applause. Thank you.